Dear congregation, I'd like to begin by confessing our faith from the Westminster Shorter Catechism and question number 43. And the question is, what is the preface to the Ten Commandments? And the answer is, the preface to the Ten Commandments is in these words, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And of course, our text will come from Exodus chapter 20, and it will be the first two verses as we look this morning at the preface to the Ten Commandments, and then, Lord willing, next Lord's Day, we'll get into the first commandment. But hear now the word of our great God from Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 and 2. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. We know that the grass withers and the flower fades, but this the word of our great God will abide forever. Let us pray. Father God, we ask your blessings now upon the preaching of your word. We pray that your spirit would use it to, to cut our hearts as the word of God is a living sword, sharper than any two-edged sword. And we, we pray that our hearts would be pierced by the truth of the very word of God, for this is what we need. We need conviction. We need, as Paul told Timothy, to reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. So I pray that that would be done now through the preaching of thy word. And I pray that your spirit be pleased to strengthen our saving faith and where there is no saving faith, that he would produce that within individuals' hearts today. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we all know, July the 4th marks the official holiday of the day that the Declaration of Independence was adopted in these United States of America. But did you know that the Continental Congress actually declared its independence from Britain on not July the 4th, but July the 2nd? And did you also know that many of the founding fathers didn't even sign the document until August of 1776? It was approved by Congress on July the 4th, but then it was sent to a printer named John Dunlap, and he printed nearly 200 copies with John Hancock's name printed on the very bottom. And it is said around 26 of those copies still remain today. One of those copies, I found this actually fascinating, absolutely fascinating. One of those copies was actually hidden behind an old picture in a picture frame that was bought at a flea market, forget this, bought at a flea market in 1989 for $4. Well, that copy was then sold for over $8 million. I don't know if that's true or not, but it makes me want to go to the flea market and buy up some old photo frames, right? Well, what does this have to do? What, is, what does all this have to do with the sermon today? Well, today we come to the preface of the Ten Commandments, and of course, a preface is an introduction. And as you know, I've just spent the last two weeks preaching an introduction uh, to the Ten Commandments, and 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 as we enter this series on the Ten Commandments, I feel like it was very important that before we, uh, before we actually dove into the text of Exodus 20, and today we're going to do that, we're going to look at verses 1 and 2, but I thought that I should lay as much groundwork for the importance of understanding God's moral law. So that's why I spent two weeks, the past two weeks, examining that, but today I want us to actually dive into the text of verses 1 and 2 of Exodus chapter 20, the preface to the Ten Commandments. And today we find in verses 1 through 2, God's declaration of independence for us. Because here in Exodus chapter 20, God is declaring his law, and God is declaring his will, and he's informing us about our duty 
to walk accordingly therein. And dear church, when a Christian uses God's law as our rule of life, I want you to know there is great freedom in that. That is a declaration of independence because we aren't trying to use God's law as a means of meriting our salvation. We are using it the way that God intends it to be used in our lives as being freed from the curse of the law. And it's very important that we understand that. What Jesus Christ did for us by obeying the law on our behalf, he freed us from the curse of the law. He alone merited that salvation for us. Because of sin, we were not able to do that. That's why Jesus Christ came, born of a woman, made under the law, so that he could obey the law on our behalf. And that's exactly what he did. And then he went to the cross. Jesus Christ, in spite of his perfect obedience to God's law and his Father's will, he still went to the cross of Calvary and hung on a cross, cursed in our stead. Why? It was for our sin. It was for our disobedience to God's law. It was for our wickedness. It was for our deceitful hearts. See, because of sin, we were not able to obey God's law perfectly, but Jesus Christ did that. He rose again to give us victory over all those things in our life. So when we become born again, when, when the Holy Spirit regenerates us and makes us alive in Christ, and by faith we trust in what Christ has done for us, and we repent, of self and repent of sin. We are free from the curse of the law, and we are free not just from the curse of the law, but now we are free to obey God's law as children of grace. We are free to receive God's blessings. And yes, there are many blessings that God has that come from obedience to his law. And we're free now to receive those things, not because of our work, it's not because of anything good that we have done, because of what Christ has done in our place. And as I preach this message, I need you to keep that one key thought in mind, that obeying God's law is a declaration of independence for us, to remind us how Christ freed us from the curse of the law. Again, our obedience to God's law is not what declares us Free is what Christ has done in our behalf. Our obedience to God's laws as children has nothing to do with us meriting our salvation or even keeping our salvation through our works. That's all been settled by Christ's finished work, and you must rest in that and in that alone. But when we've been born again and joined in union to Christ by faith, we now have the freedom. We are now declared free because of what Christ how he has saved us and atoned for our sins. We don't have the guilt of sin and we're not under bondage to sin any longer. We're not under bondage to the curse of the law. We're free from those things. We now, because of what Christ has done, have the freedom to obey and please God as his word, as his word requires. We are now free to obey God's law and to obey God's will as a rule of life because we want to please our Heavenly Father. And by, God, by God's grace, we are free to do so. We are free to do so because of what Christ has accomplished for us. This is true freedom. And we find this in the preface to the Ten Commandments found in Exodus 20, verses 1 and 2. It is God declaring to us a life of blessing through obedience to his revealed will and his moral law. And though the people in the Old Covenant certainly didn't fully understand that this was, they didn't understand this the way we understand it now, because we have the advantage of the complete canon, all 66 books that reveal these truths to us. And we have the advantage of looking back upon redemptive history and understanding how God was doing everything that he was doing as he moved through history and redemptive purposes. And they didn't have that in the Old Covenant thousands and thousands of years ago. So we see God's declaration of a life of blessing to us as we look at the preface to the Ten Commandments. And we, we see the three phrases found in verse 2, and that's what I want to look at. Number one, God's declaration of authority. Number two, God's declaration of ownership. 
And number three, God's declaration of power. So let's begin with the first phrase that we find in Exodus 20 and verses 1 and 2. It says, God spake all these words saying, but what did he say? He said, I am the Lord. I want you to know today, if we're going to live our lives in the freedom of God's grace, obeying his revealed will by his moral law, we must first and foremost understand God's declaration of authority in our lives. You see, there on Sinai, God declared this statement of authority, I am the Lord. He declares that he is the one who has the right to reveal his law, he declares that he is the one who has the right to demand obedience to his law. And I ask you, does God have that right? This declaration of authority that God made on Mount Sinai, did, did God have that right and authority to do that? And it feels almost silly, really, or, or really it feels kind of blasphemous for the preacher to ask that question, but for the purpose of this sermon, we'll go ahead and ask it and then let God answer it for us from his word as to whether he can declare his authority in this manner. In the very first place we will go is the first verse in scripture, Genesis chapter one and verse number one. In the beginning, God created heaven the earth. Now God is the only subject of that verse, which means that creation testifies to the divine authority of God alone. It is God and God alone who created heaven and the earth. By his very word, God spoke all things into existence, and he did so in, a, in an orderly fashion according to his will. And no one or no thing else, nothing else, was there with the triune Godhead in the beginning. It was just God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And his creation, his creation speaks of his wisdom and power that can be matched by no other being. Yes, from Genesis 1-1 alone, we see that God has every right, every right to declare his authority over all things because he is the creator of all things. And we see this also not just in the Old Testament, we see this repeated time and time again in the New Testament. For, for example, Colossians 1 verses 16 and 17, referencing the eternal Son of God, Paul writes, for by him were all things created that are in heaven, and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. I know it sounds simplistic, but who among us would dare say the creator of all things has no right to declare his authority by saying, I am the Lord. What man, woman, boy or girl, would you say has the authority to declare God's authority to be null and void? Would you trust in that individual as opposed to the Lord God Almighty? Or worse yet, would you trust in, in yourself? Would I trust in myself as opposed to the Lord God Almighty? Knowing, knowing myself the way I know myself? Knowing my deceitful heart, would I dare ever trust in myself or anyone or anything else other than the Lord God Almighty? No. God has the right to declare his authority, not, not simply because he was before all things and created all things, that is true, but also because he is sovereign over all things. Let me read to you what Isaiah the prophet said in chapter 41. Keep silence, this is speaking uh, the word of the Lord. He says, keep silence before me, O islands, and let the people renew their strength. Let them come near, then let them come speak. Let us come together near to judgment, who raised up the righteous man from the east, called him to his foot, gave the nations before him, and made him rule over the kings. He gave them as the dust to the sword, and as driven stubble to his bow. Who hath wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning. 
answer is this, I the Lord, the first and the last, I am he. What is the Lord saying there? He's saying, I am sovereign. He, in, in, in Isaiah 41, he is declaring his sovereignty over all things. He's saying, I am the Lord of history. It is God who ordains all things that come to pass. It is God who turns the hearts of kings whatever way he will. It is God who shows mercy on whom he will show mercy. This is the very God who speaks in Exodus 20 to his people and says, I am the Lord. And would we dare argue with him? True freedom, my dear friend, is not rebelling against this Lord, but true freedom is living in a loving covenant relationship with this very God the one who existed before all things, the one who created all things, and the one who controls all things. To rebel against him is not to live in freedom, you may think it is, but to live freely in sin, which is what you, very, you, you have, the freedom to live in sin. You can go out and live in as much sin as you possibly want to, but that's not true freedom, that's bondage. It's bondage because that sin will wrap you up in its cords and its bonds. One day that sin and that rebellion against the Lord God Almighty, the one who was before all things, the one who created all things, and the one who controls all things, one day that sin and rebellion will carry you to eternal damnation. That's not freedom. Please see that. To submit to God is true freedom. To submit to the God who says, I am the Lord, and declares his authority, that's freedom. And as he delivered his law upon Mount Sinai, he is declaring his authority to do so. He has the right to say, thou shalt not. He is the only one who has the right to tell humans, you will do this, and you won't do this. But not only do we see that declaration of authority from God in Exodus chapter 20 on Mount Sinai, but we also second see a declaration of ownership. Now, you might think, well, that goes without saying. Since God was before all things and created all things, that he owns all things. Well, you would think you wouldn't have to say that, but so many people, so many people who hate God, so many agnostics, so many atheists, they want nothing to do with God. And they would, they would never believe that God has a right to make a declaration of ownership. And yes, it's, it's true that, that, that because God was before all things and God created all things and God is controlling all things, yes, he is. And he has every right to say, I am the Lord. But, but, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 2, he adds something to that phrase. Because in Exodus 20, verse 2, he doesn't just say, I am the Lord. He says, I am the Lord, your God. Now, now he's talking to his peculiar people. Now he's, as opposed to all mankind in general, which he, God should be served as the Lord by all mankind in general, but he's not because every day people rebel against him and every day people die in their sins, rebelling and hating God. But now God narrows that scope. Now God is talking specifically to believers, those with whom he has covenanted with. He says, I am the Lord, your God. So the question becomes, have you submitted to the Lord? Have you submitted to this God who was before all things, created all things, and controls all things? Have you submitted to this God who has declared his authority and has declared his ownership? Is he your God by faith in Christ? Does the thought of living in a covenant relationship with the God who made all things and controls all things, does that, does that cause you to bristle? Does it cause you to push back? Does it cause your stomach to turn? Does it cause you to be angry? Does hearing about God declaring his authority cut straight to your heart to where you run away from him and you rebel against him more and more because you will not have this God to rule over you? 
If that's the case, I dare say you're not a child of God at all. I dare say, in fact, that you have no desire to be a child of God at all. But, but if by faith you have turned to God, and if by faith you have been reconciled to him by the finished work of Jesus Christ, if by faith you have had your sins atoned for by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, I want you to know now you are no longer at enmity with the very God who created and controls all things. Isn't that a very freeing thought? To know that God now owns you? It's ironic, isn't it? It's ironic that to be owned is true freedom. But before you turn to Christ, as I mentioned just a little while ago, you were also owned, but it was by another master. It was by sin. Dead in trespasses and sins, the Bible says. But now alive in Christ. Granted repentance to turn from sin by the finished work of Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit opens our eyes to behold what Christ has done for us. This is true freedom. Be enslaved. You wouldn't think using the word enslaved would bring freedom, but being enslaved, not to sin, but being enslaved to Christ by his grace. This is true freedom. Now when you hear God say, I am the Lord your God. Walk before me and be holy as I am holy. You don't bristle at that. You don't rebel against it. You don't run from it. You love to hear God say, thou shalt not do this. You love to hear God say, thou shalt do this. Because when we hear that, what do we know? Well, we know our Father is declaring to us his will. We long as his children to be obedient to that. That is true freedom. That is why there are no sweeter words than to hear, I am the Lord thy God. It's God's declaration of ownership. So God declares his authority on Mount Sinai before declaring his law. And God declares his ownership of his people on Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai before declaring his law, but third and finally, God declares his power on Mount Sinai before declaring his law. For you see, in the third and final phrase, God says to his people, I am the Lord your God. I have brought you out of the land of Egypt. I have brought you out of the house of bondage. What is God saying to his people? God's saying, I have saved you. God's saying, I have saved you. Not, not Ryan, not the preacher, not any pastor, not any other individual. It is God alone by his sovereign grace who has saved you if you're born again. And if you think back to the story of Exodus and the story of the Exodus, you'll remember how God brought the people out of Egypt by displaying his great power through the plagues, right? And then what else did he do? He displayed his great power by overthrowing Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a pretty mighty, to, to me, that's a pretty mighty display of redemptive power. How could anyone say that God's declaration of the moral law on Sinai was for the salvation of his people when he had already saved them by bringing them out of bondage in Egypt. That's the great redemption story of the Exodus. God is not gathering Moses and the people together on Sinai I just say, here's my moral law, keep it, and I'll save you. No, God had already saved his people from Egypt and from bondage. And now in light of that, think upon God's redemptive power in our own lives. Think about how God has saved us from the bondage of the world. When you read about Egypt in the scriptures, you're reading about a type of the world. Think about how God saved us from Egypt, from, our, from the world that we were enslaved to. Think about how, how God saved us from our sin. That's what the house of bondage is a picture of when God tells his people in Exodus 20, I have saved you from Egypt. I've saved you from the world. I've saved you from the house of bondage. I've saved you from your sin. 
God by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. He has declared his ultimate power by raising his son from the dead to give those who come to God by faith in Christ eternal life. Because Jesus was declared to be the son of God, Romans 1 verse 4 says, with power. Jesus is the firstborn from the dead, and those who are in union with him have the very same spirit, the very same Holy Spirit dwelling in those who have been born again is the one that raised Christ from the dead. That's freedom, my dear friend. We don't have to fear death because we have the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. We don't have to be afraid of what may come and what we may face because we have the same Holy Spirit that raised our Savior from the dead. Isn't that comforting? Isn't that free, freeing in your mind to think of all that? That's, that's a true declaration of independence. You may be able to sell a copy of the Declaration of Independence for $8 million, but I wouldn't give you all the money in the world for this Declaration of Independence. And so would we dare say that God cannot save? Would we dare question the declaration of authority, ownership, and power that God puts forth for us before he gives us his moral law here in Exodus chapter 20. And he says the same thing to us today as he did to the Israelites under the old covenant. He says, I have already saved you. I have already justified you by faith. I have already delivered you from the land of Egypt. I have already taken you from the house of bondage and sin. God no more expects us to keep his law as a means of salvation than he did here in Exodus 20 when he was talking to the Israelites under the Old Covenant. Dare we ever think, oh, please hear me as I come to a, bring this sermon to a close, dare we ever think that God would give us his precious son's life only to turn around and say, now keep my law and earn your salvation. And keep my law and you'll stay saved. That's not freedom. That's more bondage. That's not a declaration of independence at all. That's bondage because we know we can't do that. But we have one. We have a Savior who has done that in our place. Do you see why God's declaration of independence is seen here in the preface to the Ten Commandments? He says, I have all authority, I have all ownership, and I have all power over you. I have saved you. I have freed you from a life of bondage. Now here is my revealed will. Obey me. If you love me, you will obey me. How could we not love him when we think about what he gave up to save our souls? How could we not love him when we think about him giving us the declaration of independence through the finished work of Jesus Christ? That declaration in our lives that frees us Jesus says it is finished. By faith we are joined and we are united with him. And we repent of self and we turn to Christ alone, trust in him, and we become a child of God. We're reconciled to God. And now what does Jesus say? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And so now we understand what we're about to get into. We're about to look at the Ten Commandments, not as a means of salvation or as a means of staying saved. We're about to, to look at the Ten Commandments as a means of, do we love the Lord our God? Are we keeping his commandments? We are free to love him. We're free to love him freely because his love for us came at such a great cost. That was the death of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So my declaration to you in closing is go and love him. Keep his law. Not to be saved. I can't say it enough because I don't want to be confusing to you. Keep his law. Not to be saved. Not to stay saved. But because keep his law because God has declared you his. He's declared you his. By his authority, his ownership, his power. He's declared you his by faith in Christ. Now let us behave as the children of God by grace through faith. And we'll learn more about that in the coming weeks as we look at each individual commandment. Amen. Lift up your hearts and receive the benediction of our great God. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you. 
and lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. Amen.